Go. Mm -hmm. um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Philip Elson. Um, Jacob gave a, a good talk about what the Metaverse do. Um, I'm also at the Metaverse, and we have a really progressive policy on open source contribution. Uh, and on the back of that, I'm talking about a project that I worked on uh, as part of the Metaverse, uh, and that's Conda Forge. Now, you may have heard of it already. Um, it is, uh, if you have to slide up, uh, it is a, a, a Conda channel uh, of, of binaries for both Python and non-Python packages. Um, and kind of uh, the, the key premise really is it's got this open development model uh, where anybody can come along and add new packages. Uh, and if you find a bug with a, a package or would like to improve it, you can contribute your improvements back. Um, next slide. So um, quite an amazing uh, growth curve on Conda Forge. Uh, so essentially, we're a GitHub organization. We've got now, um, I think, over 3,000 repositories, uh, which is pretty massive. And every single one of those um, has continuous integration, uh, which builds and uploads the binaries to uh, anaconda.org. Um, those 3,000 repositories have a uh, best part of five, 500, nearly 600 maintainers, which I think is quite impressive. Um, and the channel itself is, as I say, 250, 250 gig. And the Python uh, binary itself has been downloaded uh, more than one million times. OK. Uh, so that's, that's all I wanted to say, really. Um, Conforge.org, uh, anyone can contribute. Um, and just everyone's contributions are welcome. That's all. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to very briefly talk about a Python library for simulating queues. It's called QCIW, which is Q in Welsh. Uh, the main developer of this is not me. It's one of my PhD students. Slide. Um, that's a queue. It's a waiting line. People come in. They get served. They leave. The reason we study this is self-evident, hopefully. But a huge application is in healthcare. Uh, for example, waiting lists, which is a big problem. Um, so if we consider this very simple queue where every time unit someone turns up and every time unit someone leaves. Okay, slide. This is how you'd st uh, study it in queue. You'd create a distribution, say deterministic, every one time unit. You'd create your network. Queue is actually designed for simulating very complex queuing networks. And then you'd say, I want to simulate 5,000 people going through. Uh, slide. Um, Q has these nodes, and again, you can have much more complicated networks. Inside the nodes, you have these individuals. Those individuals, once they've gone through the simulation, so they're in the exit node, have a data record that holds all the information about the individuals as they went through. Slide. Um, we can get the total times and the service times from those individuals. Slide. And obviously, it looks like that, right? If everyone's turning up uh, on one time unit and everyone's leaving, nothing is happening. Um, but that was a deterministic queue, and obviously in healthcare and other things, it's not every one time unit, despite a lot of people planning on the average, which is a terrible thing to do mathematically. Slide. Um, here's how you do it with an exponential distribution. Slide. And that's what happens. In a very simple system, now some people are spending more than 100 time units in, our, in, our simu in the queuing system, and that's why we need to understand queues and simulate queues and not just use averages. Thank you. I'm number five, is number four? I can talk for longer. <laughs> Slide two, please. Uh, slide two. So, um, if you consider yourself a research software engineer, or you have never heard about that term, but you think, wow, that's exactly what I am, or you think, well, right now I am a researcher doing software for my own needs, but I could make that a career and somehow end up in a permanent position, who knows, um, then Go to research software engineers, Google for it, however, there is a new 
initiative to network among ourselves. So there are now conferences of research engineers, national chapters are forming, they are running mailing lists, subscribe there, so that we get better in touch, that we hear about news. Uh, for instance, um, in Germany, big research organization, DFG, um, published a call, um, hand out money to make open source research software more sustainable. Uh, they will give 7 million euros, they received 120 applications, but I heard about that only when the deadline was over. So uh, <laughs> it's really uh, helpful for us to um, get into a huge network to hear about such activities. Um, from the political side, from top down, uh, much of it runs under the label open data. Um, there is a huge investment into a, a huge international collaborations, which is also necessary, also very important, but I think there is a certain imbalance between this political emphasis on open data. We should more emphasize research software, we have to lobby for it. So, uh, I wanted to talk quickly about the InThought tool suite. For those of you who don't know about it, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, the InThought tool suite is a rapid application development toolkit. So for building GUI applications in Python, uh, it has backends using both WX Python and PyQt. Uh, if you want to see sort of what it can do, I've got a very simple Charco uh, application running uh, on my laptop. A little bit hard to get it running up there, so hopefully you can see. But it's basically Built upon traits and traits UI, this is a bit like uh, React in the uh, JavaScript world. It allows you to do reactive programming. Um, and then it has 2D and 3D plotting, Charco and Myavi built on top of it. Open source, BSD licensed. Next slide. Um, so what have we been working on uh, over the last year or so? We now have uh, pretty much full Python 3 support. Uh, we switched to using Qt as the default back end. Uh, lots of improvements to Charco, including 1D plots and some speed ups. Uh, VTK 6 and 7 support for Myavi, uh, Jupyter Notebook support for Myavi, and so on. Lots of code cleanup, lots of bug fixes. We've been working on uh, bringing the code base sort of up to modern standards. Last slide. Uh, so what's coming, we have in the master branches, but not yet released, uh, better Python 3 support, uh, Qt 5 support, um, the uh, ag backend, uh, this is the 2D drawing library. Uh, we've now got a new Scython, uh, Scythonized ag backend for that, uh, thanks to uh, John Wiggins. And uh, we've got more speed ups for Charco, uh, refactoring of traits UI, and lots more bug fixes and cleanup. So thank you. Okay, so um, what I'm talking today is badges. So yesterday we learned that badges kind of have this magic power um, to influence your code quality. So what badges should your Python project have? First of all, continuous integration, basically test after each commit. And there are three services, Travis for Linux and macOS, uh, Cycles, CircleCI for Linux, and if you use Windows, AppFair. All free for open source projects. They cost if you want to test your private repos. Then we're talking about test coverage. So how many lines of code are covered by your unit tests? And there are two suites, uh, two uh, sites you can use code call for coveralls. Um, the next one is something like of inside baseball. So static code analysis basically runs PyLint, PyFlakes, and so on and so on in your code base. And they present the errors and potential flaws in your code in a very nice interface. And you get a nice badge with a grade. So that's the most important stuff. If you want to have more, you can use version I. I actually haven't used it for Python. Um, basically, it says whether your dependencies are out of date and whether you have some license clashes in your upstream dependencies. And the last one, you can go to Shields.io. It's a very nice site. And you can ho have all these hipster badges, for instance, license or PyPy version or supported Python versions. So. Um, 
Please click here and there you'll see all the badges once again with links and examples of how the GUIs look like. Thank you. Hi, who of you uses MATLAB? Who of you has used MATLAB? Who of you likes MATLAB better than Python? I know, this is Google Trends of depression and MATLAB, and look at it. So there's a better way. Of course, um, there's always one more level of abstraction makes things better. So um, this is a Python project for running MATLAB code in, uh, from Python. I mean, it starts MATLAB and then talks to it, right? So you uh, import it, you start MATLAB, which takes a while. We know MATLAB. <laughs> Sorry. And then you can run your code and you get NumPy arrays and you can ask it, you know, um, it's MATLAB. Um, also, this is so important that MathWorks itself has its own version of it. You can see on the right the MATLAB version, on the left the uh, transplant version. This is our code. Um, this is some, just calculating the sum of one million values and you can see that it takes well, we have to serialize it, send it over the network with transplant, and that takes a while, so this takes 20 milliseconds with transplant. Do that in MATLAB's own version, and um, well, eight <laughs> seconds. That's it, go to the repo. You can use both MATLAB and Python without getting crazy and have fun. Do you want to uh, click the link? So, how many people have put a package on PyPI? How many people have released a Conda package? How many people think I can do both within the space of a lightning talk? Depends if the Wi-Fi works. Um, okay, zoom in on the, the terminal -y bit and click the play button and we'll hope that there's still enough time to make, make it through this. You'll need to zoom in with the browser thing, otherwise nobody can see this. So we have a, a module here, it's got a doc string, it's got a version number, we're going to package that within the space of lightning talk. So flit in it, we're putting in some metadata, I'm cheating a little bit, I did this on my computer, it's already got some of the values saved as defaults. Um, we pick a license, and so now we have our flit.ini packaging information file, which looks like this. We are now just going to add the requirements to that, so you may have very briefly seen that the package requires NumPy and matplotlib, so we're adding those here as requirements. And I will save that file and quit. And we, so this flit init command has created these two new files, flit.ini and license. And I have added them to git, so this is already a git repository. And we'll run flit build to check that this is working. And then flit publish to put these packages on PyPI. So this bit is relatively well, relatively stable, something you can use today. That package is now on PyPI. Now we're going to go into the wilds of the untested bit that you definitely shouldn't use yet, which is Flonder, which converts Flit information to Conda packages. So that has just built Flit package, uh, Conda packages for five different platforms there. So 32-bit and 64-bit Linux and Windows, 64-bit Mac OS. And now we're just uploading them to anaconda.org. So it's taking its time there. And there we are, just about done. Uh, if you like Python conferences, then I have something for you. Uh, that will be PyCon.de, which is a German Python conference. Uh, this will be in English. So far, we've mostly been in German now. The whole conference will be in English. And it will be end of October. You see 25th to 27th of October in Karlsruhe. And that's a, a URL, PyCon.de. Next slide, please. And you see that's Karlsruhe. We are right there, this, this white dot, that's we. Up there is just, just a few maybe 200 kilometers or so from here, very close. And Karlsruhe is a very nice place to be. And it's also very close to France, very close to Switzerland, so if you want to come from somewhere else, it's not far to travel. 
Next slide, please. And we have a very nice location. This is essential for, for art and uh, media technology. It's a very nice place. And we have very nice rooms. And that's the team. And that's we are also on Telegram and Twitter. So if you want to have more information, you're invited. Uh, I think the paper. The call for papers is close, so we are about to publish the program in the next day, so, so that will, the program will be up. We have trainings, we have talks, uh, there will be two days of sprints. So please come to Karlsruhe to, to continue your Python conference here. Thank you. Thank you. So. I love great APIs, so I tried to do the SciPy API design. So the first thing is, no, okay, next slide. Nope. Hey, the first thing is consistency. So for instance, this is an example of two different uh, functions that have arguments, the similar arguments that are flipped over. I can never remember or two different arguments that are named almost the same, the same way, in the same library. I can never remember. The second thing is that functions are easier to understand than classes. Uh, objects have hidden states. Objects have no universal interface. Entry point, out point. So, other thing, a library should hinge on a small number of concepts. So the idea being, if you understand a usage pass, uh, pattern of a, of a library, can you use it in other places of the library? Can you use it everywhere? So this is a bit more abstract, but how many things do you have to explain to someone so that he understands the library? Common data containers make the ecosystem stronger. They facilitate working with multiple libraries together, and they make it easier to get uh, up to speed with a given library. So uh, as an example, I would rather have 100 algorithms on one data container than 10 algorithms on 10, uh, uh, each time on 10 different data containers, right? Each function should have one and only one uh, uh, purpose. Uh, the interesting thing would be a change of behavior depending on the type of, uh, on the input type. Code for interfaces, of course, but don't overdo duct typing. So the interface defines the object, but incompatible behaviors lead to bug. Think about the NumPy matrix. Properties are for impedance matching, and I'd like to say only for impedance matching. Properties will obfuscate the uh, data model of an object, and they can create hidden costs. Shallow is better than deep. So objects are understood by their surface. And composition is great for design, but it creates overload. OK. Switcher. Oh, yeah. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so we've all heard about how transparency and uh, less, less centralization is very important to make research better, uh, to make researchers more independent, and I think that's particularly relevant in publishing. So I'd like to talk to you a bit about reproducible self-publication. Um, generally, you might feel that you want to share your data as IPython notebooks. I think that's one one of the concepts which is very well known here. The problem is that that's not really a big format. The big formats are like presentations, poster, article drafts. And the usual use case is that you can have a couple of killer figures which you want to put in a presentation for your colleagues, in a poster for a conference, another presentation for another conference, and hopefully in an article draft. And ideally, you can put the figures which you get from your Python scripts directly into your, your document. This is a LaTeX document. This is not a bitmap anywhere. This is generated directly from Python code, as is this, as is this. The code for this looks like this in the LaTeX document. It's very simple. You have a small wrapper, and then you call a figure, uh, you call a, a function which has here the location of the script, a label if you want to link to the figure, and also a caption if you want to pass the caption directly to the figure. All of these places, like this place, supports LaTeX tags. Uh, if you want to print LaTeX tag with the same uh, Python code with the same technology, you can use these uh, verbatim uh, containers. You can also do tables directly from, uh, from uh, CSV files. This is really cool. We do it via the pandas to, to LaTeX interface. 
which we can call internally. And of course, if you want to look at a couple of examples, because this is all about giving you the power to just fork and go, you can find it on GitHub, this presentation, as well as a poster and an article following using the same technology. And my poster, which is outside, and the poster of my master's student, which is also outside, have been written with this technology. You can see them compiled and on paper, and you can download the source code. Thank you. Hiya, my name's Alex, I work at my office informatics lab. I'm gonna to talk today about uh, an easy way that you can access structured data sets from within S3 without moving them out. Next slide, please. Uh, so I probably, maybe don't need to introduce OpenDAP, but just in case, it's a really cool protocol and project that lets you subset remote data sets. The kind of traditional way you might set that up is to have a bunch of data on a server, and then a client can access data on the server through an API. Next slide, please. Uh, so our problem is that our data isn't on the server, it's on S3. Uh, our tools don't work with S3, they work with OpenDAP. So we put together a plugin that proxies NetCDF requests um, for, to the Threads OpenDAP server into S3, uses byte ranges so it doesn't move much data around. You kind of get the best of both worlds, you get the cheap-ish storage of an ob object store, and you get the flexible API of OpenDAP. Uh, and it's completely generic, sorry, one, uh, it's completely generic so you can access any NetCDF object, you just need to point it at the right um, key. Thanks, next. Um, so you could do that in the kind of classic uh, middleware server style, but now that it's just proxying requests, it's not doing any work, you can run that code on your laptop, so there's nothing between you and S3, and it also empowers you to scale data access up, right? S3 is theoretically infinitely scalable, so you can have a cluster of computers or you know, having their requests proxied directly into S3. Um, the code for that is on GitHub, but it's like a real prototype. Um, we basically just sort of kind of mushed together some work that much other people had done. Um, and the data that we're building that for is on um, S3 at those buckets. But again, this will work with any NetCDF or HDF data. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be speaking about CartPy. CartPy you can use to create maps and different projections and uh, plot 2D data onto it. So it interfaces with map.lib to make uh, the plotting of data very simple. So next slide, please. Um, so here we've got a very simple example. We uh, set up the projection that we want our data to be projected into, uh, and then we add uh, p color mesh data to that. We uh, specify our longitudes and latitudes and our data array, and we tell CartPy that the data was originally in a plat carry projection, and we want to reproject it into this interrupted good homolysine uh, projection. And that is what you can see there. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, CartPy can do more sophisticated plotting. So here we've got a couple examples of it reprojecting WMTS data and also accessing OpenStreetMap tile servers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Base map, base map exists in a similar area, but they are coming to the end of the development. Uh, and Cartify was originally developed to improve on um, base map. So if you are still using base map, I'd encourage you to move over to Cartify. So next slide, please. And uh, finally, uh, contribution, uh, contributions are very welcome to our GitHub Cartify um, repo. And Cartify is also available on Condorforge if you'd like to play around with it. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm just going to talk about my project Astimo. It's a pretty niche project, but I'm hoping this will give it some publicity. Uh, if it uh, models um, nanostructure, it models the quantum mechanical band structure of uh, nanostructures called quantum wells, if any of you study physics. And it particularly studies them for real semiconductor structures, and it um, includes various um, real physical effects that shift it from the more abstract math you might have learned at university. Uh, it works particularly well at the minute for uh, gallium arsenide structures, uh, but it can also model other types of materials. Uh, there's also another, there's two solvers, one for conduction band and one for that does valence and conduction band. And uh, just really hoping that if anyone ever needs something like this, again, they'll 
this will help them find it. And if anyone wants to contribute, it's, uh, it's all on GitHub. The address is at the top. Uh, and there are tutorials at the website uh, in note notebook form for anyone who's interested. Thanks very much. Hello. Um, so I have a question. How many of you use uh, Miniconda for your continuous integration to the automated test? Right. So typically, uh, the setup looks like something like this. We start by downloading Miniconda, and then we install it, and et cetera. So uh, here we, we download, for instance, Miniconda latest, which we expect to be the latest version of Miniconda. It turns out that uh, next, that this actually links to, uh, to some outdated version from 2016. And uh, that you should use either Miniconda 2 or Miniconda 3 now. Uh, and this this link was removed from um, from essentially the, the Miniconda repo. It still kind of works because there is it's cached somewhere. But basically, uh, by removing this link, we we break the CI of like three thousand projects, right? And so uh, so essentially, the the expected behavior is that next. <clears throat> that the developers will, will just see that CI is broken, they'll just search online, find the problem, implement the fix, and then, uh, then it'll be fine. But, but this is a waste of resources because we have like uh, how many th hundreds of developers all, all looking for the same thing and all trying to fix the same problem. So this also applies, for instance, if we want to fix uh, some vulner vulnerabilities, if we want, there is some URL that I said that uh, changed and we need to change it in all the repositories that use it, etc. So the question is, can we actually try to, to uh, make, uh, apply some changes across GitHub repositories? Next. So here's a, a, like an idea that is uh, at the very early stages. So basically what we do, we, we, we choose some GitHub repositories, we fork them, then we create a, a single repository with using shallow clones, and then we make a PR to that one repository. Uh, and then we have some kind of synchronization engine that, that pulls back the changes to the different forks and makes those uh, separate PRs, right? So we can, we can synchronize using, for instance, Git patches, which is just text files. If you want to talk about it, uh, let me know. Okay, in this morning, my talk, I said I am a committer of Apache High Mall project, and it's Java, so I have no way to talking about it from here. But honestly, I have a way to talk about it in a connection between Python. And High Mall is a project uh, which realizes uh, ma launching machine learning algorithms on top of SQL syntax. So if you want to launch logistic regression, you just need to simply write 10 lines of SQLs, and that's it machine learning launches on top of Hadoop environment. And our company, Treasure Data, hosts a customer managed data management platform. And we provide customers to analyze their data on top of cloud environment. And our environment behind has two query engines. One of them is Presto. It's a memory really fast query execution engine developed by Facebook. And another one is Hive, which was developed of course, you know, uh, developed by Apache Software Foundation. And uh, basically for heavy query, we can launch Hive query and customer launch Hive query. And behind that, uh, we have Hive mode. So we put the machine learning functionality into the Hive uh, query executor on our services. And here is a Python code. Uh, we provide Python connection uh, to execute query on top of cloud uh, query executor on our services. So we have mainly for our customers, but it's public, we developed some Python packages. So TD client Python, you can execute query on our environment or TD uh, pandas TD, we can execute uh, pandas query on top of that. So, SciPy is going to be a connection to the cloud environment. That's it. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, I'm Lucas Dev, working at Inria mostly on uh, Scikit-learn and JobLib, and I'm going to talk about something I've been involved in, which is called Sphinx Gallery, and it's uh, something to improve your documentation with a gallery of uh, example. The inspiration, uh, as uh, most of you probably uh, are aware of, is Matplotlib. So basically, say I have uh, you know plotted the something in a while, so I go to the Matplotlib documentation. Visually, I can find something that kind of looks like what I want. So I click on the example, I, I copy and paste the source code, I tweak it, and in and, and a very short amount of time, I'm able to, to do whatever I want. So, uh, so basically what happened is a lot of uh, a few packages at, uh, at something like this, like a gallery, and you know they tweaked it their own way, and basically it kind of diverged, and Sphinx Gallery is an attempt at kind of consolidating the features in a single uh, library that hopefully uh, a lot of projects can use and improve. So that's how it looks. Uh, you have the gallery, you have an example, you can click on any of these thumbnail, uh, uh, these plots, and then you get to the source code. And not only can you get to the source code, but you, uh, uh, these days you can have a kind of rich text uh, and cells kind of that kind of look like, a, a, I mean, Jupyter Notebook kind of thing. Um, also, something that is quite useful when you have your reference at PI that's automatically generated. It's generally quite obscure, so you want a way to know how to use it, and now it's automatically added. You can uh, configure Sphinx Gallery to automatically add uh, uh, all the examples that use this uh, particular uh, class or function that you're looking at. Uh, something that's been read, uh, added recently as well is you can export your, all your example to notebooks. So if, you're, if you want notebooks uh, that uh, people can execute, uh, you can do that. Uh, more details. I have five seconds left, so I will show you. Plenty of people are using it. Scikit-learn uh, and uh, PyTorch is using it actually. Uh, AstroPy and Matplotlib as well. And use use the sprint. Uh, use the sprint if you want. We'll be around. So if you want to get started on using this. Cheers. Uh, hi again. Uh, this is a talk from me, Phil Elson, not me, the Mass Office employee. Uh, and this is about a fun thing that I just did, and I thought uh, maybe I'd share it. So, uh, anyone recognize this font by any chance? XKCD. Right, XKCD. Kind of universally uh, recognizable. Good. Uh, so, uh, Matplotlib. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved in getting Matplotlib to kind of speak XKCD, and this is actually a visualization uh, produced by Matplotlib, uh, and yeah, they are. Um, the one thing that always upset me uh, about this visualization was the font, it turns out. Um, and there's kind of like different weights, uh, spacing's not great, the sizes aren't great, but um, yeah, so. Uh, I was aware of a data set that, that Randall Monroe, the creator of XKCD, produced, uh, where he basically kind of gave us some, some characters and some spacing, um, and I really wanted to turn this into a font. So I did. Um, so there's a bunch of tools that I made use of. Uh, first of all, uh, that image uh, I segmented, uh, kind of la labeled so that I could pick out the characters. Um, I used a tool called FontForge, um, which has a Python interface that um, allows you to build up fonts and, and put spacing together. Um, and I kind of set this all running within Docker so I can kind of reproduce this font. Uh, and it's all set up on a repo at um, ipython slash xkcd font, um, where kind of if you were to make any contributions, those changes would percolate through nicely. Now, that is a link if you wouldn't mind clicking it. Um, and there is also, um, oh, I'm going to run out of time. Um, there's just a link here. Uh, live preview. Just see if a bit. Uh, uh, anyway, um, what I was going to say, there's a live preview um, where you can go and type and play with the font and uh, kind of see that in action. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you.